bring them to the meeting with me. Two. Um, the other thing is, if anybody who's here that wasn't here for the mic class last week, I, there's three handouts over there that I had. Uh, if you didn't get one, you can grab them. There's the MDAR mic brochure <laughs> with, its, with its mistakes. <laughs> And then there's a graph, this graph paper that you can make copies of to, to track your, your mic counts during the season. And the <coughs> Health Coalition uh, handout there, which is really good. 27 page thing off. Mic classes if you have that. Um, but for you who got them and anybody else, this said, I said there were two mistakes in that brochure. The they have brochure, and there are actually three. So one was the, the, the time period for drone trapping, they have 14 to 28 days. And of course, if you leave the drones 28 days, you're going to have a high flow point. So 21. 21 to be safe. Uh, the list of the, the mic count threshold is three mites and 300 bees, and it, it should be six. That's the record in any way. And at the end of the oxalic acid vaporization treatment says you can do it the ice rooms on. And the label recommendation is that you don't. Um, so, so ours, we are going to reverse. But I think I was saying that we we're going to show this video, Morales do that video, and then have Kristen do her. Um, Spring prep thing, but you know, no one like myself, I tend to run over time with these things. <coughs> I want to make sure that we have enough time for this because we can show the video anytime. You know, in a club meeting when I have maybe a short duration speaker or something. Uh, I really want to make sure we have enough time for Kristen to do her whole thing and for questions and all. And then we'll see if I have time for the video at the end. We will, and if not, we'll do it another time. But I think that makes sense to do it that way because this is the really important stuff right now because it really will be spring at some time. <laughs> <laughs> so, our speaker tonight has been keeping honeybees in the Boston area for a decade. She has a degree in plant ecology and years of experience in the Boston culinary scene. She reveres the honeybee for its ability to intricately weave together local agriculture, the seasons, fine food, and environmental stewardship. She's passionate about practicing and teaching techniques to support vibrant bees and a healthy environment. As an integral part of managing sustainable honeybee hives, she raises her own locally adapted queens from her stronger survivor star colonies. She shares her knowledge about honey, honeybees, and pollinator friendly landscapes and public programs workshops and one-on-one -on -one high side consultations. She acts as a beekeeping mentor, helping newer beekeepers to manage robust and productive beehives. Together with her bees, she produces Bussy, is it Bussy or Busy? Bussy. Bussy Brook Honey, which is served at some of Boston's top restaurants. I give you Kristen to come. So if anyone has trouble hearing me, even with the mic, please let me know. And I'll do my best to be a little bit louder. Um, so this fun little video that I put up for anyone who wasn't here when I first started it is one of my small nukes in February, which is just astonishing. We had these beautiful three days in a row of gorgeous weather. The bees were out collecting pollen like mad. I saw um, actually four or more different colors of pollen coming in on that day. Um, and just a fun little thing, this is not even part of my presentation, but it's so pretty, I just wanted to show it so we can all dream of spring. Um, a fun little factoid is this is a side-by-side -side nuke overwintering situation. I actually keep them like this all season long. I do them side-by-side. -side. They share that middle wall, which creates a, a beautiful um, shared form so that they can raise brood all throughout the season. It's great in the summer, too. They, they share thermal regulation. But if you were looking just at this film, you would think that that second nuke is actually not thriving. 
But the fun thing is that it's just a completely different configuration. Those bees are up top, so you just it's out of the frame, but there's just as much activity happening, but it's right up top. And um, this nuke is active near the bottom, which is just a fun little um, snapshot of genetic variation. These were made up at the same time. They're the same strength. I use the same exact management techniques to put them together, but one of them channeled up into the top, and one of them moved up and then moved back down, and they had honey in the same places, so it's kind of kind of interesting. Anyways, for anyone who's a new beekeeper, just a, a show of hands so I have a sense of the audience. First year beekeepers, like haven't even got your bees yet. Okay. So a few, and now um, going into your first spring after getting these last year. So a few more, all good. Great. Um, so my talk is really geared toward beginners and advanced beginners. So I see some faces in here of more experienced beekeepers. I hope there's something that you can glean or at least enjoy the pictures. Um, I always learn something no matter how basic the talk. So. Um, I hope that you all enjoy it and gather something from it. And for now, I will put away the beautiful pollen flight. Oh. I know. I'm just curious, where do you think you're getting four different colors of pollen in February? Where, where um, where? Maple, um, willows, okay. maybe a little skunk cabbage, but skunk cabbage you tend to see them really dusted all over their bodies with pollen, and I wasn't seeing that. Um, alder, speckled alder, uh, witch hazel. Yeah, there's a lot that comes in bloom. The real trick is that we get flight days when the bloom is happening, um, and we just haven't had them all March pretty much. It's been just a little too cold and a little too wet for them to get out and fly. Um, okay, so just a little bit about where I'm going tonight and um, kind of my concept of what I wanted to share with you. Um, again, this is geared toward people who are entering their first overwintered season or people who want to get a glimpse into what to expect next year if you're starting these for the first time this year. Um, and for people who don't know me and don't know my management style, I just wanted to give you a little window into some of the things that I hold as a high priority with my beekeeping and things that I think are good for other people to adapt to their own beekeeping style. Um, so one of my priorities when I keep hives is to keep productive colonies. And productive colonies, yes, they produce a lot of honey, a lot of brood, but usually they are also healthy colonies. Um, and this is really the number one thing that I'm looking for from my bees, is nice, healthy looking colonies. And health is so multifaceted, it's something Ed's been talking a lot about lately, and something that we all need to focus on as beekeepers. Um, first and foremost, what Ed was talking about last week, what everybody in the state, the nation, the world, um, what people are talking about are mites. Um, and this is something that we all, as beekeepers, have a responsibility to keep track of getting good mite counts. I use alcohol washes. I strongly recommend you use an alcohol wash. Um, these are handy dandy pre-made little things, but you can make one out of a mason jar and a piece of one eighth screen. Um, another aspect of keeping healthy bees is being aware of what your bees are bringing back to the hive. All of my hives are on organic farms that are either certified organic or are um, practicing organic growing techniques, um, but just choose not to be certif certified. If you're starting bees in your backyard, you may not have a choice as to where they're going, what they're foraging on. But you can be aware of what you're doing on your property, and you can start talking to your neighbors about what matters to the bees. Not putting chemicals in their garden makes a big difference. And if you talk about this with your neighbors and bring in a little honey, you might be able to make your neighborhood a little bit more healthy for your bees. Um, another thing that I think is really important for strong colonies are uh, having great queens. This is a really nice fat queen that I raised in one of my colonies. 
Um, and personally, I think great queens are locally raised queens. Um, I've gotten some really beautiful queens raised in California. I've gotten some other queens that are um, resistant to mites, um, hygienic queens. And I think it's fantastic to occasionally buy new genetics. But there is nothing that beats raising your own queens, and it's really easy to do, and we're going to talk about it tonight. All of these factors taken together with a little bit of management skill will bring you to successful overwintering of your colonies, and this is really where beekeeping starts. If you get through your first season and yet your bees don't make it through that first winter, you don't get to take it to the next level, and that's where all the fun starts. That's when you get surplus honey, that's when you start to be able to make splits and to really have some fun with learning about what's going on with the biology of your hives. Um, and this is actually one of my other hives. This is at a farm in Canton. Um, and this is in January, taking orientation flights on a warm day. Um, so a little background about me. I started about 10 years ago. Um, similar to how a lot of people start, I just had two hives in my backyard. And I quickly learned there's a really steep learning curve. Um, it's an absolute blast, a lot of fun, but there's a lot to learn. Um, so I'd love to share some of my takeaways from my first couple years of beekeeping, and hopefully it'll help some of you who are just starting out. Um, this is from one of the mass beekeeping meetings, the one that they do in the fall. There's some really great speakers. You guys are here tonight, so that I know you're the audience who will be taking advantage of this. Highly recommend going to all the meetings you can go to and keep doing it for as long as you're beekeeping. It's a really great way to make connections with other beekeepers. Um, and making connections with other beekeepers is a great way to continue the learning hands-on. I really recommend doing hive dives with friends. Um, it's a fantastic way, even if you're both new beekeepers, another set of eyes gives you um, just that much more insight into what might be going on in the hive. Plus, there's one person to hold the frame and the other to take the picture, so you can look at it later. Um, Norfolk County has a fantastic mentorship program. Take advantage of it. It's a great way to um, help assess the health of your colonies, but it also is a way to potentially um, discover things that are going on in your hive that you might have missed on your own. And my biggest takeaway from my first couple of years, mites. They're the number one thing that inhibits your colony from overwintering successfully. Just as an anecdote, my first two years, I thought that I would treat mites using um, powdered sugar dusting, which is not recommended anymore. But when I started, people were still saying that it worked. I counted my mites and I used powder sugar dusting as a way to control. The idea with that was that they would start grooming and knock the mites off. Um, it just doesn't work very well. I lost my hives my first two years using powdered sugar dusting. Um, my third year I started using organic mite treatments and had 100% overwintering success for four years in a row. So once you get the hang of overwintering your colonies, that's where the fun starts, like I was just saying. And now is when you have an opportunity to really grow your apiary, if that's what you want. Um, so this is the most exciting time of year. This is, you know, this time of year on a warm day, you see the bees pouring out of the tops of your colonies. And um, it's when management starts, spring management starts. So today I'm just going to talk about three main topics in spring management. One of them is early spring management, which um, usually is over this time of year, but it's still cold, so you may be still in this phase. I'm also going to talk about making splits. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can make splits. I'm just going to talk about a couple. Um, and then I'm going to talk about swarm management and a little bit about swarm biology. Early spring management. So really the, the most important thing this time of year, February, starting in February, is when I think about spring management starting. The most important thing is to make sure that your bees don't starve. Um, I feed starting in February if my bees need it. If they're all the way up at the top and I can see the cluster, it means they've worked through that honey in the top box. 
So I'll put food on. If I see them, I call it if they're up. If they're up, I give them food. Um, this time of year, brood rearing has already started. It requires a lot of energy to keep those um, larvae well fed and the heat that they need to generate to keep 93 degrees in the hive is an enormous amount of energy. So they may blow through their food really quickly. They may have consumed most of what they put away in the fall, especially when we have a mild winter. And we do not have consistent foraging weather this time of year. So I can't stress this enough. This is the time of year where starvation is most likely to happen. You're not out of the woods with overwintering your hives yet. Um, you really need to make sure that your hives are not starving. Um, so in order to feed your hives in February and March, um, I lay the food out, have everything ready to go. Um, I use just a small three by three inch square of protein substitute. And then I make a nice moist um, fondant that feels a bit like um, <coughs> maple sugar candy. I put them on paper plates because that's what Howard Crawford did. Um, I don't know if all of you know who Howard Crawford was, but he's a fantastic, um, was a fantastic older uh, farmer in Franklin who I believe he founded our club, right? Or was one of the original founders. Um, anyways, yeah, he can back farm in Franklin. Um, so have your food ready to go, all laid out. And then you just crack the top, um, put a small piece of the protein right in the center of the cluster, put your fondant right on top of that, right over the center of the warmest part of the cluster, and close. You don't want to have your hive open for more than a couple seconds. Don't linger. Um, while you're doing this, you can actually assess your hives for strength. Um, you don't need to do much to do that, just see how big the cluster is. And if they're not up yet, you can put a gloveless hand right over the top of the top frames and see how much heat is flowing out. Um, a colony in March that covers eight to 10 frames uh, is a good strong colony and the warmth will really radiate out of that cluster, you'll feel it. A weak colony is only three to four frames in March um, and you'll feel just a gentle little heat rising. If you're not feeling anything coming out, that's kind of the danger zone. Um, so I really love to plan um, for the upcoming season and set some goals for myself. And I really recommend this for newer beekeepers, but also for people who've been doing it for a while. There's so many different styles of beekeeping, so many different directions and things you can focus on. Um, it can really feel overwhelming. So I like to pick just a couple things to focus on each season, little bite-sized, attainable um, goals and really work toward those. It can really keep you focused and also um, be something that once you attain it, it makes you feel accomplished. And always remember that it's your beekeeping experience. Make it what you want it to be. What would you like to accomplish this season? Maybe you'd like to try overwintering side-by-side nukes for the first time. Maybe just two of them. Maybe you'd like to do 10 of them or more. Maybe you'd like to do what Larry Connor loves to tout in some of his books. Larry Connor is the gentleman who does all the essential series of beekeeping. He loves the idea of two and a half hives for a backyard beekeeper. The half a hive is a nuke, and it serves as a resource for an extra queen if you need it. It serves as a little bit of a pressure valve. If you have a really strong colony and you want to take some brood out of it so it doesn't get too big, you can put it in the nuke. So it ends up being a really great system for keeping a nice balance for a backyard hive situation. Maybe you'd like to raise a queen, or 25 queens, or more. Maybe you'd like to go back to the basics and just focus on mites and really get a handle on monitoring for the mites and controlling the mites. Maybe you'd like to increase your apiary, go from one hive to three. Maybe you'd like honey this year for the first time, or maybe you'd like more honey. Maybe you'd like to have an awesome pollinator force for your farm or garden. Whatever it is, my recommendation is that you don't overextend yourself and that at the core of all the choices you make, the one thing you keep in mind at all times is to respect the lives of the bees. They are living creatures and 
once you've started a project, you need to finish it um, and have fun. So once you've planned for spring, you have an idea of where you're headed, make sure your equipment is ready. You don't want to be stuck at the last minute putting stuff together. I like to use April 1st as my deadline. It helps get me going in the winter to make sure that I get everything put together, painted, assembled, cured, um, and ready to go. And I would say to anyone who's starting out new this year, the bare minimum, I would highly recommend you get a cardboard nuke box and 10 extra frames. You don't have to have a lot, you don't have to spend a lot, but if you have an unexpected storm or something happens where you need to split your hive, having this amount of equipment will make that feasible. If you have set a larger goal for yourself, just make sure your equipment matches it. Okay, and now for the fun hands-on stuff, which some people have already done maybe on one of those warm days. I haven't done my spring cleanup yet. Um, but this is where you make your first dive into the hive. I like for it to be a 55 degree day and for it to be a still day, not windy. Um, I do like to bring a little extra equipment with me, but this is optional. If you don't have it, it's no big deal. Um, what I like to bring with me is um, an extra bottom board, an extra slotted rack. I really love slotted racks. An extra root box, and then um, a drop box. You can use an old white sheet, a white towel that isn't too fluffy. Um, so going back to what you do with all these things. So when you do spring cleanup, it's still pretty chilly out. They need to keep their brood area at 93 degrees. So you want to be as efficient as possible. You don't want to rush yourself, but it's nice to move along. So what I like to do is I will take the outer cover off and lay it down upside down, and then I will stack all of the brood boxes on top of that outer cover so that all that's left on the stand is the bottom cover, uh, excuse me, the bottom board and the slatted rack. And since those require cleaning and scraping, I'll just move them off to the side and put the fresh clean ones down, put an empty brood box down, and then you can go frame by frame just very quickly. Don't take too much time on this, but just a quick little clean of like the real big pieces of propolis, moving them over one by one so that you have an empty box from your original stack, throw the drop cloth over the, the hive, and then you can scrape out that empty box and start the process all over again. Just helps keep you moving so that you um, don't chill the hive too much. Um, again, don't linger on a chilly day. Um, make sure to remove your feeder shims when you're doing your spring cleaning. Um, this is actually a picture of one of my hives in March. So you can see, um, experienced beekeepers will notice that that on um, the inner cover there is actually comb that they had built already. Um, and inside that comb, when I took it off, I found eggs. Um, so the bees will draw comb up in that feeder ship. They'll, the queen will lay eggs in it as a double waste of energy for those poor bees. It's really hard for them to build wax and for the queen to lay eggs. So remove the feeder shim early so this doesn't happen. Um, so this is a time also to replace old frames. It's a good idea to replace all of the wax in your apiary every three to five years by rotating out old frames. This helps to reduce toxins. Uh, wax is good at storing all sorts of chemical toxins that the bees pick up. Um, and it also helps to reduce pest issues. Um, and it also increases the usable comb space in your hive. Replace them with nice, bright, fresh, white foundation. Or if you go foundationless, just give them an empty frame to draw out. Um, so, Choose the dark frames that are mostly empty to remove. Um, don't take anything that has brood in it. Anything that is being used gradually through your first few inspections, you can move them further and further out toward the walls of the hive until they're not in use anymore. Um, you want to remove anything that's 10% or more of the frame that has odd-shaped cells. I don't know, here, point. These ones here are drones. Sized cells, pretty much all of this is drone sized cells. 
Um, you can see that the surface of it is very wavy. It wouldn't nest very well with the next frame. Um, so you want the majority of the frames in your hive to be nice, uniform, and straight. Anything that has holes, dents, um, that's bowed out to one side or the other, you want to remove those. And anything that has entombed pollen. Does anyone know what entombed pollen is? Um, so this is an image of it. Occasionally the bees will discover something in the pollen that they don't like. It could be a toxin. It could be that the pollen has gone bad. They will case it with wax to essentially um, cordon it off from the rest of the hive. This is unusable space. It'll just remain like that for the remainder of the frame's life. Um, so I already talked about that. So when you put in your new frames, you want to put them outside the brood area, especially early in spring. You do not want to do that. Um, you can tell the lighter colored frames are the new frames. Um, what happens if you do that is you're breaking up the brood and you're potentially causing chilled brood. Chilled brood is when they can't maintain that beautiful 93 degree temperature in the brood nest and you end up with this very sad situation of the brood dying, turning black, shriveling up. Um, so age old question, reverse the boxes or don't reverse the boxes? Some people do it and swear by it, some people don't. I do it sometimes and I don't do it other times and I have these cute little schematics to <laughs> describe when I do it, but essentially the whole idea is just don't break up the brood nest. So this is um, my setup, I use all mediums, so this is what I overwinter with in my hives, three mediums. If you have brood that's just in the top two boxes, I'd probably reverse that. If you have brood in a double deep situation that's spanning the top and the bottom box, don't reverse that. You're gonna break up the brood. If you have it just in the top box, it's your call, but you could reverse that. You guys get the point here. Essentially, again, don't chill the brood. Um, I also, even if you do reverse, I put an entrance reducer on its smallest setting over the entrance, and I use a slatted rack. The slatted rack creates a little bit of distance between the chilly air coming in the front entrance and the brood, and the entrance reducer reduces the amount of cool air flowing into the hive. In the early spring, you still have fairly cold temperatures. I use it all year round. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, sure. So um, it goes on top of the bottom board and underneath the bottom brood box. And these slats in it here um, line up right underneath each one of the frames above it. So this is a 10 frame slotted rack. And what it does is underneath, it's got a whole bunch of space where in the winter or early spring, um, cool air can flow in but not get up into the brood. And in the summer when it's hot, the bees can cluster there and help regulate the temperature in the hive without having to beard out all over the outside of the hive. Right, that's the point of the slats is they won't build comb there because that's blocking the frame right above it. Um, so it, it's not considered part of the inside of their nest. Um, so now I'll move on to making splits. This is, I think, the most fun time of the year. So there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, there are benefits to all of them. So I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of making splits. Um, again, locally raised queens is one of the beautiful benefits of making splits. Um, it really helps you prevent swarms in your hives. It provides insurance for your winter losses if you have extra hives that you can use to replace your winter losses. You can increase your apiary dramatically by making splits. Um, you learn a lot about queen biology and just honeybee biology by making splits and have a ton of fun. Um, so I'm going to talk just about two different types. Uh, the type of split that you make depends on several things. It depends on the season that you're in. It depends on your goals, and it depends on the conditions in the colony. So the first type of split, um, the things you would need in order to do this are a strong colony, 
one of those ones that had 10 frames of brood in March, or not 10 frames of brood, but the cluster covered 8 to 10 frames. Um, and you'll need a mated queen for this type of split. So these are great for early season splits before we can raise queens locally because the temperature doesn't allow for drones and mating flights. Um, it's really great for reducing swarm pressure. It's great for adding new genetics to your um, apiary. And it's great for quickly increasing your apiary. The overview of this split, essentially you're allowing the original queen to stay in the original colony. You're making a healthy split and you're adding the caged queen to the split. So step one, identify your strong colony. That should be easy. Step two, buy a mated queen. Don't make the split until you have her. Sometimes people order queens and for whatever reason they get delayed or they fall through and then you've made the split already and then you find yourself in an awkward position. Wait until she arrives. The day she arrives, if you can, make the split. I like to line up all of my equipment right in front of the hive that I'm splitting from so that it's really easy and ergonomic. Um, and you've got your extra frame set off to the side, you've got your bottom board, you've got your empty box right in front of the hive. Find the queen in the mother colony. Um, for those of us who love marked queens, this is pretty easy. If you don't use marked queens, it can take some time, um, but it's really fun. Put her safely aside in a nuke box. If you've bought one of those cute little cardboard nuke boxes, that works great. Put her in the shade, even on a cool day. The sun can really warm up uh, a nuke box and overheater. And as an aside, I strongly recommend you get comfortable with picking up queens and marking them. It's really a great way to keep track of the queens in your hive. It also gives you added confidence when you're doing inspections. You know where she is because she's easier to spot you run um, less of a risk of damaging her. So if you're starting out for the first time with picking up and marking these, start with drones. They can't, they can't sting you, um, so you can practice on drones. I love using these little marking tubes. They have the double um, benefit of holding the queen, allowing her to dry inside the tube, um, but you can also mark her through the tube. And she sure is easy to find when she's marked. Um, so the next step in making this type of split, which um, I'm calling a cage queen split, although you could call it a number of different things, um, is to select three to four frames of excellent capped brood. You want to take frames that have clinging nurse bees on them. And then you're going to shake in an equal number of brood frames to get even more nurse bees into the nuke. You want the frames to really be covered. Well, I'm calling it a nuke, but this is a, you can use this as a 10 frame split. Actually, the numbers I'm giving you are for a 10 frame split. And just as an aside, um, for anyone who's not familiar with what a nurse bee is, nurse bees are the youngsters. They're the ones that are good at taking care of brood. And this is fun. On this frame, we have quite a few ages. This girl right in the middle is the youngest. See how she has like fuzzy goggles around her eyes? She's like newly emerged. And the girl right next to her is a little bit older. She's still got a little bit of a fuzzy thorax, but she's a little bit older. This one here is a little older still. This one over here is like ancient, like she's probably a forager. See how she's got a bald, a bald thorax? Um, if you come back to inspect your split and find that it doesn't have very many bees in it, you can always shake more nurse bees at the entrance. The idea with this is that you shake these on the ground in front of your split and the foragers will fly home. You can do it from any of your strong colonies. Make sure to find the queen first. Don't shake your queen out. Um, and then put up like a little stick or anything, um, an entrance reducer or an empty frame as a ramp. Some of the younger bees <coughs> don't know how to fly yet, so, but they'll crawl right into whatever colony is right in front of them. After you've got your beautiful brood frames in your split, you want to add pollen, um, at least one frame of pollen, one to two honey frames, honey or nectar. Um, and then the rest drawn comb if you have it, or foundation. You want to put all the brood together in the center, pollen right next to the brood, 
honey outside that, and then the empty frames outside that. Gently replace um, your frame with the queen in the original colony and backfill that colony with your extra frames. And again, um, drawn frames if you have it, but keep the group together. You can put the entrance reducer in and move the colony to its new location. It can go right next to the parent colony if that's the only spot you have. It's ideal to move it a couple miles away. That way the foragers will stay with it. But if you don't have that option, I've done this a lot and it works great. The one caveat, of course, is that a lot of the foragers will fly home, which is why I'm having you shake a bunch of the nurse bees in. Nurse bees are young, they haven't oriented yet, they won't fly home, they want to stay with the brood, so you'll have that beautiful population left. Um, I like to wait overnight until I introduce the queen in the split. Some people just wait a few hours. When you're keeping your queen inside overnight, keep her warm, like a warm room temperature. 75 plus is great. Um, and then what she needs, if you have her more than a day, is just a single drop of water on the cage. I dip my clean finger in a clean glass of water and just touch the cage. I don't know if you can see that, this is just a little bit of water here. You don't want to overdo it. Um, so you're going to place her in the split, right in between the um, brood frames, right in the center. You need to have the screen fully accessible by the workers. Um, same as when you install your package, make sure that they can access that screen. And then feed your split one-to-one -one syrup, especially if it's dodgy with light weather. I like to use top feeders because they can come right up through the warmth of the cluster. Um, gently confirm that the queen has been released from her cage in about five days. Remove the cage, don't use a lot of smoke, and don't linger, just remove the cage. Make sure she's not stuck in there. And then wait a week and look for eggs in a week. And there's nothing, you don't need to go much further than that. If you find eggs, then you can close up and let them get settled. Um, as an aside for anyone who hasn't seen it, if you don't see eggs and then you wait a while and then you wait another while and then you come back and you see this, this is a laying worker situation, multiple eggs in a cell, um, multiple eggs on the sides of the cells. Sometimes you'll find eggs on top of pollen, kind of chaotically all over. This is when a worker is, um, a whole colony is stressed and workers will try to lay eggs. They're unfertilized, so they're all drawn brood. It turns into a mess. So it's really good to avoid this situation. It's hard to turn around as well. Continue to add space for your new colonies. They can grow really, really ridiculously fast. Um, there are a few variations, which I'm going to skip because I'm totally going over. And um, the, one of the variations that I just wanted to point out is you can do this type of split with all sorts of different queen cells. Um, I like grafting and have occasionally grafted from my own colonies and created my own queen cells and put those into splits just like the one that I described. This is a queen cell with, this is a plastic queen cup that I grafted into at the top. And this is the queen cell stuck in between two brood frames. This is the plastic top of the, um, the grafting cup. So this is something you could do later in the season if you decide to play with grafting. Um, so split type number two is um, making a split when you have a colony that's intent on swarming. And we've all found ourselves doing this type of split at the last minute so we didn't expect to. Um, it's great for stopping a hive that's on the verge of swarming. It's also great for raising your own local queen. And it's great for taking advantage of the um, the natural desire of the hive to reproduce. Um, so in this one, we're going to take the original queen out and we're going to um, raise new queens from the swarm cells. So essentially, you just need to identify a hive that has already started swarm cells. Um, one caution for any new beekeeper is if your swarm cells are already capped, you need to be really careful. You need to know that your queen hasn't already taken off. And this is also a very sensitive time. If you see this and then say, oh, I'll split it in a couple days, you may be too late. When the um, swarm cells are capped, it 
Swarming is really imminent. It can happen any minute. Um, just as an aside for anyone who's not familiar to identify different types of queen cells, um, show just a few different types. These are actually queen cups, which are not queen cells at all. They have no egg, no larva. They're just the beginnings of what people call a practice cell. So these are common in all healthy colonies, and they don't mean that the hive is thinking about swarming. These are emergency cells. These are um, last minute, oh my god, cells that a hive will make when their queen is all of a sudden not there. And this can be from beekeeper error, it can be from a sudden failure of a queen. Um, and these are cells built from existing worker larvae. They tend to be lower quality queens. Um, super seizure cells tend to be singular. They tend to be good size. They do tend to be on the face of the frame, but they don't have to be. Swarm cells tend to be at the bottom of the frames or on the sides of the frames, on the edges. Um, but again, they don't have to be there. They can be almost anywhere in the colony. The difference is that you usually see um, several to dozens of these cells in a colony when you're thinking about swarming. So for this type of split, you identify a strong hive with swarm cells. Again, same thing. Get your equipment all ready to go right in front of the hive. Um, find the queen, put her in a nuke box to keep her safe. Select your nice brood frames, um, making sure to leave nice brood of all ages behind in the original colony. And here's the tricky part. You want to make sure you're leaving nice swarm cells behind because that's going to be your new queen. So be really careful when you're doing this. Um, queen cells are really flat, fragile. Uh, you don't want to shake, dent, crush, exposed to the sun or exposed to too much cold. They're very sensitive. I like to use a shim in between boxes when I'm doing this type of split so that I can create extra space underneath the frames when I'm stacking and unstacking frames so that I don't damage the cells. Is everyone familiar with the shim, the little spacer rim that you put on top? Um, and you want to pry the frame slowly. And again, you're going to shake an equal number of nurse bees. Um, you're going to place the old queen in the split, so you're going to move her over and fill it with pollen and honey. Um, fill the original box in the original colony with um, the empty frames and just, again, be really careful with the queen cells. Um, so I like to return to the original colony in about three to five days to remove all but the two biggest, nicest looking queen cells. If you leave too many cells in that original colony, say you leave a dozen, you could potentially have 10 little tiny virgin queen swarms coming out of that colony. If you do have a ton of queen cells and a lot of bees, make another split. You can take one of the queen cells and put it in a nuke box and make a split just like the first scenario that we talked about. So you want to leave the original colony that has those queen cells in it, leave it alone for three weeks. You keep a close eye on both colonies. You can add honey supers to that colony, but you don't want to do a full inspection. Let them get that queen emerged, cured, out for a mating flight and back and laying. Adding honey supers just gives them expansion space without disturbing them. And the colony that does have the queen in it, it will need expansion space um, pretty soon after you make the split. Um, and just to review queen cell math, it's really important when you're doing splits to know where your queen is at. Um, so day one, egg in the queen cell. Does anyone know when the um, cell is capped? Yep. And then when does she emerge? 16. And then this is where it starts to get a little bit more fuzzy because there's a little more variation. But she needs to solidify her wings, get ready for flight, get out for her mating flights, and that can be weather dependent. But about 12 to 26 days, she'll be mated. And she can start laying the very next day. It could take a few days for her to get going. So about 27 to 30 days is when she'll be laying eggs. So when you go back at three weeks and you're looking for eggs, it's really important not to skip this step. Sometimes a queen will go out for a mating flight and not come back because she gets picked off by a bird or for whatever reason gets caught in a rainstorm. Um, if you don't see eggs, wait a few more days, go back again. 
look for eggs again, but don't wait too long. Again, um, you can end up with a laying worker situation. So this is a queen cell that has, I think it's like a dozen eggs in it, which is a laying worker. Desperation. If that, you know, before, before you get here, um, if you find that you're not getting eggs um, after three and a half weeks, you can just recombine them. So newspaper combine is a really simple way to do that. Just throw a single sheet of newspaper over. You don't even have to put slits in it. They'll find their way through the paper. And then you're all set. Um, so things to remember when you're making splits is a split is just a colony in miniature. Whether you're talking about three deep boxes or one medium box or just a couple of frames, um, all you need is balance. A healthy balance is dense coverage in the brood frames. You really want to see nurse bees over the entire frame. You want pollen. If you don't have natural pollen in the frame, you have to give them supplement. You want honey and nectar. It's really hard for a split to get out forage. Um, if they are in the same yard and all their foragers have flown home, you need to make sure that they have honey in there and feed them. And you want room for them to expand, give them an empty comb. I like to think in percentages. These are gestalt type numbers I just came up with. It's not written in stone, but I like to think of my boxes as being about 75% full of bees. Um, Frames-wise, I like about 30% of the frames to be brood, 10% to be honey, 20% to be honey and nectar, and the rest empty comb. Um, a good population size is really critical. It reduces pest problems like small hive beetle and wax moth. It alleviates stress, um, helps with thermoregulation, and it is absolutely critical for healthy brood rearing. Um, for quality queens, there's a few things to keep in mind. Um, essentially, how early the, the larva was started to be fed as a queen matters. Um, swarm cells are really great queens. Emergency cells, not so much. Um, how vigorously they're fed matters too. A large colony is much better positioned to feed a cell well. So large colonies um, raise better queens. The genetics of the parent colony matter. If you have a couple hives and one of them has always been more productive, it's always been healthier, and it has thrived with fewer mite treatments, choose that one. How well the queen is mated matters. Um, there's not a lot you can do if you have one hive in controlling this, except the time of season that you do a split. Don't ever ask um, a queen to go out and mate when there are no drones out there. That's just not going to be a successful mating situation. So do it during swarm season when there are plenty of drones out there. If you do have the ability to set up some sort of um, drone source, should be about a quarter of a mile away from where your queen cell is emerging. Um, and it should be a non-related colony, so one that is distant genetically. And so just some points to remember when making splits. Again, just a summary. Large colonies make better queens. Large swarm cells make better queens. Only raise queens when there are ample drones. Um, Small colonies are more accepting of caged queens, which is why in that first one you want to introduce the queen in the smaller colony. Um, they're just less defensive. Uh, make sure frames of the split have good <coughs> coverage of nurse bees. Feed your splits. It really helps them get settled and get going. Give the parent colony and split plenty of room to expand. And um, I suggest you don't raise queens after August 1st. It's really hard to get the colony ready for winter when you start after that. Um, so I'm going to breeze through. Should I keep going? Yeah? yeah. I'm just going to breeze through swarm management. Um, I'll probably skip through this first section. I'll just make mention of it. Um, I have heard a surprisingly large number of new beekeepers say they don't really care if their hives swarm because they want to repopulate the world with bees and they want to save the bees. And I just want to make a, a little nod toward that <laughs> comment, um, although I'm sure in this room everyone thinks differently, but who knows? Um, so 
Firstly, honeybees are agricultural animals. Um, we shouldn't be repopulating North America with honeybees. They're not actually wild here. Um, Larry Connor, in one of his articles in ABJ, said that only about 16% of swarms that make it into the wild survive more than a year. So even if you do think we should be populating North America, um, it's not very successful. And of course, this is the number one thing. You are the ambassador to, of your bees to the environment around you, and neighbor relations are really important, and this is a wicked hassle for someone to have bees living inside. Um, this is actually bearding happening on a brick facade of a building. Um, this colony is huge and will be enormously expensive to remove. Um, plus, you've, you've probably spent all this time coming up with these beautiful queens. You may potentially lose good genetics if you allow your hive to swarm. Um, definitely will lose population. You can go from a hive that looks like this, which is boiling with bees, to something that's very sparsely populated. And when you lose population, you lose honey production, you potentially um, decrease your ability to overwinter your hive, you weaken your hive, plus all the money you've invested and all the time you've invested into making these girls um, happy and healthy and then you just let them wander off into a tree. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what triggers swarming. Um, the number one thing that triggers swarming is crowding, which dilutes the queen pheromone that's exchanged in the hive. Um, uh, an excellent nectar flow. This is one of our top honey plants in this area. This is black locust. Um, when this comes into bloom, it's this boom of nectar coming in and that can really trigger swarming. Um, lack of comb space for the queen to lay in. If every single square inch of comb is full of brood or full of nectar and she has no place to lay, it will trigger swarming. Poor ventilation and overheating can also trigger swarming. Again, um, those slatted racks are amazing, so highly recommend it. Um, some quick management techniques to prevent swarms. Number one is supering early. Um, nice looking colonies that have a lot of capped brood and a fairly good population of adult bees, I would add a super to. If you have the same situation but it's full of adult bees, I would add two supers at once. Um, rule of thumb of when to add another super. If that first super you add is about half full, add one more. If that super you add is about three quarters full, the next time you're back, add two more. Um, some tips for supering. I like to bottom super, which means that the new super I'm putting on goes straight above the brood, underneath the one that they've been working on. It encourages bees to move up. It also decreases pressure in the brood nest. Um, and that's where the good comb um, builders are, is in the brood nest, so they're coming up right from the brood into building out those um, frames. Um, if you're adding two supers at the same time, and one of them is foundation, and one of them is drawn out, put the foundation below the drawn out one. And for people who use queen excluders, I do. A lot of people don't use queen excluders and think that they're superfluous. Oops. Um, I turn them 90 degrees if I find that the bees aren't moving through it. And so that, by that I mean um, the rectangle of the queen excluder is sticking out on either side of the hive. It gives a blank spot in the front and the back where the bees can move straight through. And the queen, I've never seen a queen go through that scenario. I'm sure she could, but she doesn't tend to go up through um, those little two inch slots. Um, some other tips for newer beekeepers who haven't been through a season yet. Tapering of wax production is really dramatic in summer. So what could be drawn out in a week and a half in early June by July, they're really going to slow down. Don't expect your bees to draw wax past mid-July. They might. I've had some nukes that were building wax in October, um, but you can't expect that to happen. So one of the other management techniques we've talked about a little bit in other ways, but um, increasing ventilation by using a screen bottom board, using a slatted rack, and you can't even see the holes here, but here's a hole, vent hole, 
and here's a vent hole. Not only does that help with ventilation, but it gives the bees a shortcut into the areas that they're working on so they don't have to walk through the brood nest constantly, which helps reduce crowding. Um, I like to remove my screen bottom board inserts on Memorial Day and leave them out all summer unless I'm doing uh, a passive drop measurement of mites. I use slatted racks year round. I like to open the entrance reducer when I see bees getting backed up at it. And then during robbing season, uh, which happens when the bloom kind of tapers in the middle of summer when it's really hot, I use window screen in all the vent holes and the bottom entrance and make a really small entrance for the bees to come in and out, just a couple bees with, to reduce robbing. Um, keeping young queens really reduces swarm intent. Young queens born in the previous season are much less likely to swarm than older queens. And young queens born in the previous season are in the prime of their lives. They're the best for brood production. Um, and of course, throughout swarm season, you want to check for queen cells. This is a method that Mike Palmer likes to use. A lot of commercial guys like to use this. This is what I call a flip check, where you just take the top box and flip it up 90 degrees, and then you can see the swarm cells on the bottom of the frames. You do have a chance of missing one this way. So especially if you only have a couple hives, I would recommend you go frame by frame. Um, it can be really easy to miss them when they're covered with bees. Uh, I like to check once a week during May and June. Never destroy a queen cell until you're sure you have a queen. The first thing you're looking for every inspection is eggs. Always look for eggs first. Never destroy an advanced queen cell without taking extreme action to change the swarm intent. Um, and this is going back to doing a managed swarm split or caging the queen. Um, signs that your hive is thinking about swarming. When you see a ton of drone brood, that's a sign. When you see them putting nectar, I don't know if you can see this, but see how each of these open cells is shiny? Mm -hmm. So every place that there's a larva hatching out, or excuse me, an adult emerging, um, they're backfilling with nectar. That's a sign that they're thinking about swarming. Uh, when you're having bearding happening on a cold day, um, that's another red flag. And obviously, if you have large larvae in swarm cells, they've already decided to swarm. Um, and this is the time where you make your managed swarm split. And if all else fails, everyone who has the best intentions has a swarm occasionally. Um, do your best to collect it. Call someone in the club to come collect it if you're at work and can't do it. Um, usually you're lucky enough that they're low enough and you can reach them every once in a while. They're like just out of reach. Um, but they're pretty easy to catch. They're really docile. You don't even really need to wear a veil. I always wear a veil, but you don't really need to. And you can use anything to catch it. I caught this one in a five gallon bucket. You can use a cardboard box. Um, you can use a nuke box. You can use anything. As long as you get the queen, they'll march right in. And they can grow really fast. They're fantastic colonies. All right, so I'm so sorry I went over quite significantly. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah. So. So. Yes. Yes. Actually, there's a couple of really great ways to do splits um, without finding the queen and um, let's see I'll just tell you one of them and it's called um, a shaken split so you do the exact same philosophy as that first way that I showed you but instead of finding the queen and instead of taking all of those frames with bees on it you're going to select three to four nice brood frames a pollen frame a couple honey frames and then the empty ones and you shake all the bees off into the hive. That's the key, because you don't know where the queen is, into the hive. And then what you do is you put that split, put a queen excluder down, you put that split right back on top of the hive, and leave it overnight. 
And what happens is all the nurse bees will come to protect that brood. They've self-segregated. And then the next day, preferably early in the morning before the foragers have left, you take that box off. So the queen is down below because you shook all the bees down there. And then you've got your, your split. The reason I don't like doing that is it's, um, it's just two steps instead of one. We could have never seen this queen. Yeah, I mean, some, some queens are just hiders. And I've seen that too, like ones that really run from the light and they'll run like burrow through a hole or they'll run onto the side of the box or, um, yeah, and paint, paint marks can come off with time. So um, it could be that she's no longer marked. So it doesn't matter whether or not she ends up at the top or the bottom. Oh, she will end up in the bottom. So with, with this method, into the hive, and then you put a queen excluder down. No, you let the bees do it themselves. Yeah. So that is another way. That's called a walkaway split, and some people do that, just separate the hives and don't care where the queen is. Um, I, I don't know, I'm a control freak. I like to know a little bit more about what's happening in my hives, so I don't like doing that, but... Um, um, it depends how far along the swarm cells are. So if you're finding very, very tiny, tiny larvae that have just hatched the day before, almost so small that you can't see them, what you essentially see in the bottom of the cell is like milk, and you can't really see the larva, you might get away with that, but you have to remove every single cell. And by every single, I mean like shake the bees off every frame and make sure every single one of those cells is out. Um, and you will have to do that once every six days for the rest of swarm season. A lot of people do that. Ed Warchall swears by that. He does that. Um, if you don't know who he is, he's one of the hive inspectors for Mass. Oh, yeah, sorry, Ken Warchall. Um, so yes, you can do it. But if they're more advanced than that, it's really fighting against a strong tie. Um, and you'll probably end up losing the battle. I don't know. <laughs> if, they're, if, if they're long but not capped, there's a chance that they won't swarm. If they're capped, you're, it's pretty much certain that they'll swarm. And if you destroy all those cells, and then they swarm, you've left yourself in a bad situation. Um, it's better to like be proactive rather than reactive, if you can, and try to give them a lot of ample space and check in on them frequently and not get to that point. Um, but making splits are, are pretty easy. It's intimidating at first, but once you've done it once, um, it gets easier every time. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm just curious. I noticed on some of your um, frames up here, you had a spacer inside where you had put your feed on the frames themselves. Uh -huh. It looked like, a, like a, some sort of rack that you put in there. Uh -huh. so that yep. all the paper and the bond that came on that. Yes. And whatever. It's, I haven't heard anything about that. I'm just curious. So this is something that I just made myself. Um, I call it a feeder rack. A lot of people make them. I think they probably even sell them, but they're so easy to make that I just make them myself. Essentially what it does is just provides a little bit of space underneath that solid food so the bees can walk underneath it and access it really easily. And when you go to put it in, you're not crushing bees um, because otherwise there would be bees all over the tops of the frames and then you're dropping a solid piece of fondant on top of them and potentially smushing the bees. So it has kind of a dual purpose. Thank you. Sure. You had mentioned about the entombed uh, pollen. I have grown up in the older hive of a couple years old. It came case, not in June, but in the full rack, uh, full frames of pollen. Uh -huh. A couple of questions. How long is that good for? And I mean, if I drop it, I'm, I'm, 
Is that worth keeping or should I just get into those? And can we, can um, so I will tell you what I do know and then I'll de de defer to other experienced beekeepers in the room. Um, pollen is turned into bee bread by the bees and the reason they do this is to change the pH and the chemical makeup of the pollen. Pollen fresh on its own degrades very, very rapidly and the nutritional quality plummets almost instantaneously. But once it's turned into bee bread, it can last for quite some time. It does degrade slowly. When I have frames of pollen like that, I store them in the freezer um, because that helps um, extend the life of the nutritional quality. I don't know how long you can keep a pollen frame at room temperature and have it be nutritionally viable. Yeah. Um, Will they reclaim them? Um, pollen is tough. So bees will pull out dead brood. They'll also pull out honey and nectar and move stuff around. Pollen and bee bread, they, they don't really pull it out unless they're consuming mm -hmm. it. So it could end up just being dead space in your hive. Um, you can do an experiment and see if they take it. Usually the bees are smart about taking only stuff that's nutritionally viable. They're very choosy when they're out foraging. If something's got more nutrition to it, they'll gravitate toward that. Let's see one more question. Uh, you mentioned about feeding. Uh, it looks as though the, uh, you know, you get into a the marsh. When should we put on the syrup? I usually think of April 1st as being the time, but it's still, in my opinion, too cold. Um, so I like for temperatures to be up in like the mid 40s at night, um, and it's not even close to that. Um, so I think it's really kind of a case-by-case -case basis. For some of my hives that are building wax in the feeder shim, I am going to take off those, those racks and shims just because otherwise it's a mess. But I think, you know, weaker colonies probably, I would leave solid food on for a while because they don't have the population to cure um, nectar and to keep a nice low humidity. The problem with putting food on is A, it gets really cold at night. And if they have increased humidity in the hive, they have trouble keeping warm. So it, it, you end up kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you put syrup on a weak colony. And if that syrup freezes, um, if you use in jars and the syrup freezes, you'll, you'll lose the vacuum in there, and when that thaws, it'll fill into the hive. One more question. Like, okay, it's too, it's too cold. Your quantity recipe is a little more soft. Um. Yeah. So I think it's about um, timing and temperature. I've heard a lot of people say they have trouble making fondant, but I don't do anything special. You do need to use a thermometer when you make it. I bring my, um, so I blend two to one syrup with water, bring that to a boil, put in the sugar, and let that simmer until it hits 238. And I stir it at that point to make sure the whole body of the fondant is at 238. And then I let it cool slowly until it just starts to get opaque and then I stir it and pour it while it's still very pourable. And it really does come out like a soft maple candy. Um, you can really, if you stick your thumb in it and it just completely dents in, it's really easy for the bees to get at. If you make something that's hard candy, they can eat it, but it takes a lot of work for them because they have to blend water with it and they have to scrape at it. And it can be tough for a stressed bee to get enough food quickly enough. Do you have any cream of tartar so you get an invert sugar? Um, I haven't used cream of tartar. I do actually use a tiny bit of corn syrup um, in my recipe. I use one eighth of the syrup I use is corn syrup. Um, but I've never used cream of tartar. I think that would be the invert sugar too. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Are you doing research on any particular aspect of no, I don't do research personally. I mean, I have notes that I keep on my bees, and I take mental notes of things that have worked and haven't worked, but I don't do any official research. Question? Can you talk? Can you talk?
doing the serve? Yes. Yeah, I, I love top feeders. So. Um, the top feeders that are my favorite, if I'm going to give a little plug for one company or another, Brushy Mountain, I think, makes the best ones. So I've heard people say that uh, they don't like using top feeders because bees drown in it. I don't find that to be the case at all. Um, so the one thing that I do with pouring syrup into these is I do what I call a warning shot. So I'll pour just a little bit on both sides so if there are any bees in either side, they'll crawl up onto those little floats, the pontoons that are in there. And once they're up on top of the wood, then I'll pour in more syrup. So I just pour like a half a cup in each side to get the bees off the floor. But I really love these. The, the bees are able to come up through that center where the cluster's the warmest. Um, they're able to access quickly. So in the fall, if you need to feed, you can get a lot of food into the hives quickly. Um, and they don't leak, and there's no trouble with them breaking if they freeze, and all kinds of stuff that makes them really when yeah, I was a saving grace this fall for one of my hives, I, I, I had two, one was heavy and all get up, the other one was light, and I threw that on there and filled, literally filled it to the brim, and they just took it down. Oh, yeah. like, within 24 hours, it was amazing. And they were flying around the other day like crazy. So, one more question? Great. How do you prevent robbing with this? Oh, um, really, really good question. I wish I had put another slide in here. Um, when you put these on, they go straight on top of the hive, and then the inner cover goes on top of that and block the entrance of the inner cover with screen. So the only way to get to the feeder is through the whole hive. And again, during robbing season, you'll have the hive really um, uh, screened off all the way, so that there's just a couple little tiny holes that bees can come through. And you want to close the holes that are closest to the feeder, definitely. Great. Well, thank you very much. I hope you still Thank you. I won't go through this whole thing. It's, um, <clears throat> 36 minutes or so, but in the, the way this video was broken up was um, to the like, first year, first year and second year going through the thing. So in the same vein of what we've been doing, I guess, we'll just, I'll start with the year two, this is because it's a similar thing. We're going to look at April, April year two, so it's going to be a spring management type of thing on there over winter, um, and it will be uh, in, uh, along the same sort of theme. Now this is um, Minnesota, and so some things are different. And uh, one of the things you'll see is um, three brood boxes being used because they want to have a whole solid box full of food on top. Um, so there's some things that are different, but it's just it's just interesting. Um, Marla Spivak, if people don't know who she is, she's a uh, Professor at the, uh, of uh, entomology at University of Minnesota. She's one of the uh, people that developed uh, or did some of the early development on uh, hygienic bees, you know, mite resistant hygienic bees. There was a strain called Minnesota hygienic that I mentioned the other night. Uh, and she's just constantly doing, doing research and doing education on bees, and she puts this thing together. So, We'll just, uh, oh, I need sound. So we'll do here too. Here too. <laughs>
The first thing to do in early spring is provide pollen substitute. In mid-April, when the temperature is above 50 degrees, clean the dead bees from the bottom <coughs> line of the winter colony. If your colony has over six frames of brood, conduct a partial reversal. Rotate the position of the top two boxes to provide room for colony expansion. Later in the month, conduct a full reversal. The manual will illustrate how to arrange the boxes. <laughs> Replenish the colony <laughs> if necessary. Divide strong colonies about six to eight weeks before the main honey flow. In our area, we make divides during the dandelion bloom. Dividing your colony will help prevent swarming and will aid in mite control. You will introduce a new queen into the new divide, which will help the colony winter successfully. The colony that is to be divided should have a brood chamber consisting of three deep hive bodies, a large adult bee population, and a minimum of ten good frames of brood. A full reversal was performed on this colony earlier in the month. Order a new queen in advance from a reputable queen breeder. At least four days prior to the expected arrival of your queen, arrange half of the frames containing brood into the top hive body and the other half in the middle hive body. Place any remaining brood frames in the bottom box. Place the queen excluder between the top and middle hive bodies. The excluder will confine the queen within either the top box or within the bottom two boxes. Four days later, inspect the hive bodies to locate eggs. The box or boxes that contain eggs will also contain the queen. If you see eggs, it is not necessary to see the queen. If eggs are found in the top hive body, remove the middle brood box, which is queenless, for the divide. If eggs are found in one of the bottom two hive bodies, remove the top hive body for the divide. Place the hive body that contains about half of the brood but no eggs on the bottom board in a new location in the apiary. This newly established colony is the divide. The unit that contains the other half of the brood and the queen is left at the original site. This is now the parent colony. The parent colony will be the honey producing colony for this season. The new divide will be the colony that winters and will become the honey producing parent colony the next season. The bottom hive body of the parent colony is moved to the top so the colony has room for expansion. Two honey supers should be provided to the parent at this time to provide space to store nectar. Remove the entrance reducer and corks. Let the device sit from 12 to 24 hours before introducing your new queen. During this time, older bees will return to the parent colony, leaving younger bees in the divide, who will more readily accept a new queen. Introduce the new queen using the slow release method. Remove the cork from the candy end of the queen cage and make a 
hole in the candy with a small nail. Be careful not to skewer the queen. <laughs> Slightly separate two frames containing brood in the middle of the high body. Suspend the queen cage in this space with the screen down. Center the cage on one of the frames just below the top part. These two frames will have to be pushed together to hold the queen cage in place. Close up the hive. <coughs> Refill the pail of sugar syrup if necessary. Do not disturb the divide for five to seven days. During this time, the bees will chew through the plug of candy in the queen cage, releasing the queen into the colony. After five to seven days, Gently open the divide and look for eggs and larvae to be sure the new queen was accepted. A deep hive body, preferably with drawn combs, should be added on top of the divide. Inspect the divide every seven to ten days until the major honey flow begins. Add the third deep hive body when the second one is mostly filled as you did for the package. When the third box on the divide is full, conduct a full reversal, moving the top box to the bottom and the bottom box to the top. Honey supers can be added to the divide over the third brood box. After the honey supers are added, it will not be necessary to inspect the brood nest until fall. The brood nest of the parent <coughs> colony will remain in two deep hive bodies for the remainder of the season. This is the colony that will produce surplus honey for you to harvest. It is not expected to survive the winter. Inspect the parent colony every seven to ten days after making the divide. Reverse the two hive bodies on each inspection so the queen will always have room to lay eggs and to give you an opportunity to check for swarm cells. Bees swarm in early summer when they are congested. Before swarming, the bees begin to rear queens from a number of larvae present in the colony. They enlarge the cell around the larvae so that the cell hangs vertically, and they feed the larvae large quantities of royal jelly. You can discourage them from swarming by destroying the cells with your hive tool. Continue to perform reversals to expand the brood nest and relieve congestion. When the first two honey supers are mostly filled with nectar, add two more. Continue to add supers to the parent colony throughout the summer as needed. In late summer, you will have honey to harvest. Remember, leave colonies to be wintered with about 75 to 100 pounds of honey. The honey you will harvest will come from the honey supers, not from the hive bodies containing brood. Remove all the bees from the supers using one of several methods. Keep the supers covered as you work. With a sharp motion, shake the bees in front of the hive entrance, or Brush the bees off the frames in front of the hive entrance using a bee brush. Vigo, or honey robber, can be applied to a fume board on top of the super. The vapors will drive the bees out. This works best on warmer days. The super should be aired out before extracting. A bee blower will force the bees from the supers. Use a high volume, low pressure blower. A leaf blower or heavy duty shop vacuum set to blow will work for this. You need at least one of the following. Capping scratcher, Uncapping knife, uncapping plane, or automatic uncapper. You will also need an uncapping tray to catch the wax cappings. An extractor, either power or hand crank, will be needed to extract the honey. This is a centrifugal device that spins out the honey. A strainer is used to strain the honey as it comes from the extractor. This can be a coarse screen to get the large pieces of wax, 
a nylon cloth to string all of the wax, or a double screen. A container will be needed to store the honey until it is bottled. Depending on your honey harvest, this may be quart jars, gallon jugs, five gallon pails, 55 gallon barrels, or a tanker. Extract the honey the same day it is removed from the hive whenever possible. Any honey held for extraction should be kept in a warm, dry room. Remove the cappings from the combs. If the knife does not remove all of the cappings, use the capping scratcher to remove them. Place the uncapped frames into the extractor. In a tangential extractor, turn the basket slowly at first, then pick up steam as the frames empty. Partially extract one side of the frames, turn them around, and extract the other side. Turn them around once more, and finish the first side. The frames will have to be spun from 5 to 20 minutes per side. If you spin full combs too fast, you may damage the combs. An electric radial extractor will pick up speed slowly. <laughs> Frames do not need to be rotated in this type of extractor. <laughs> Open the honey gate and strain the honey into a settling tank or bucket with the gate. Let the honey settle to allow any wax to migrate to the top of the tank. Bottle the warm, strained honey in clean, attractive jars or plastic containers. Let the honey run down the inside of the bottle to prevent bubbles from forming. After the honey harvest, select those colonies that are strong enough to be wintered. With the management scheme we have outlined, you will only winter colonies in three deep high volume of young queens. These colonies will include new package bees and divides. Remember, to winter your colonies effectively, your colony should have a young queen, no mice, or as few as possible, no diseases, adequate honey stores. Prepare your colonies for winter as you did the previous year. If your colony has a young queen, is disease and mite free, and has adequate honey stores, your bees will survive even the harshest winter. Bees cluster within the hive during the winter. They shiver their flight muscles to generate heat and feed on honey warmed within the cluster. This colony will be strong in the spring. It was the divide the previous spring. Next spring, it will become the honey producing colony. If a colony is wintered without adequate stores, or if it is not treated for mites, it may succumb in the middle of winter, as did this parent colony. It is best to take colony losses in late fall. A quick summary. Remember, our system depends on four basic principles. You should select good equipment and a good location. Your queens should be young and prolific. They'll need nectar and pollen stores at all times and your hives should be disease and mite free. There are as many ways of keeping bees as there are beekeepers. The management system shown here is based on the natural life cycle of the colony in northern climates. Beginning and experienced beekeepers have had consistent success with this system over many years. Consult the manual for more details. <coughs> Take time to observe and enjoy your bees. Treat them well and they will return the favor.
well, you know, she said, she said you don't know, expect them to survive, but there is, in the, in the first part, there is something about that where they, they actually may. So she ties together through the but they think, you know, a lot of people with, with a lot of these like that, they don't want to put the effort into even trying to get the weaker ones through. Yeah. And they just let them go. Yeah. Um, so, so you see that they have the three bosses, but they're also eight frame. Um, and, and so in Minnesota, you need eight, three, three deep boxes. Um, as an interesting aside in terms of northern overwintering techniques, I mentioned to you, a few people, to you, I think also that there's a great series of videos from the University of Guelph. Um, they do a whole series of videos for beginning beekeepers and they're up in Ontario, um, so they're dealing with a very harsh winter as well. And they overwinter in much, much smaller setups than that. He actually does side-by-side -side nukes in a single deep with a single super shared on top of them. So it's fascinating. It's two different approaches to wintering in a very... University, University of Guelph, G-U-E-L. Yeah. 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 Well, those are they're, they're all on YouTube, and there's a whole series of videos, and they're really well done. I would recommend them. Well. Uh, Heather Matilla, did she, did one of, uh, she just spoke at one of our meetings. That was last November. She was a student, and I think she got her technology uh, degree. And she worked directly with the gentleman who does the videos. Um, so his name is Paul Kelly, and he's in charge of the Honeybee Research Center up there. And um, Heather studied with him. Yeah. Was she now Wilson? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and uh, there was an EAF conference <coughs> a couple of years ago. So it's kind of a deep place, you know. So that was interesting. And the people, you know, know people too, you get to see uh, introducing a new queen. Because basically that's you know that's the same way we would do it here. You know, it's just trapping the cage in between two frames. Our eyes and they would have a wire to hang it in, and I think that's what you did. Did you in school too, right? Yeah. Then the piece of wire to hang the queen cage in between. Yeah. Well, so either way, that way they have less chance of it falling. You know, if you can back it again. Uh, but you know, see, there's a lot of the same principles about washing the swarms and so on. Uh, and you notice that she mentioned, you know, well, if you keep on scraping out the swarm cells, you can avoid it. But, you know, they, they, they're also doing splits and they're also doing a lot of box reversals. So they're on top of these things constantly to try to try to keep that from happening, too. I had something in the back. When she put the, um, the queen cage in, it was facing down. Is that the way it's supposed to go? No, she put the she had the screen facing down. Right. But the important thing, and, and so that's not the way we usually do it. I mean, we we it always it down, is, right? well, you're putting it in sideways. Right. Side. But as long as the, the the screen needs to be facing in a place where the bees can get to her to feed her. Right. right. But the important thing is that the release hole is not facing down. Right. So you've got two ends to your queen cage. One end has a solid cork in it. The other end has the candy in the yeah. cork. You want the candy to be facing up because if there are tendons in the cage and they die, they can block the hole and then the queen can't get out. But when they put it the, in sideways like that, it will it, it work the same way. But once they eat through the candy, she can come out through the side. I like going up and down myself better. Well, you can also open it and see the thing. Yeah, you can just look right down. If you put it down between the two boxes, you can look right down in and see if the if the candy's gone and, and know that she's released without disturbing herself. Yeah, that's what I do. But, and that just shows you all the different method, you know, methods they are. I mean, obviously this stuff works for her. Um, but it's just another point of view. I just thought it would be interesting. We can show the other half another time too, but uh, I wanted to give Kristen all the time to, to do all of hers. So that's about all the time we have. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Monday night is our April meeting, and we're going to do um, spring management once again. Uh, <laughs>